This is the third in a series of hearings this committee has held on the implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the unique challenges faced by states, localities and agencies in using and tracking Recovery Act funds. This hearing will also examine the paramount question, is the Recovery Act working? Five months ago, Congress committed nearly $790 billion of taxpayers' money to an effort to stave off and reverse a tidal wave of states' deficits, rampant layoffs, and sinking personal income. With, it, with billions of taxpayers' money on the line, it is vital that we keep a watchful eye on the money being spent, the programs being executed, and the methods by which we measure progress towards revitalizing our economy. Today, GAO is releasing its second bi-monthly report on state and local use of Recovery Act funds. Frankly, there is good news and bad news. The good news is that money is flowing from the federal government to the states at a faster rate than the Congressional Budget Office predicted at the beginning of this year. I am also pleased that the Recovery Act has helped states and localities reduce the severity of budget cuts to the programs that unemployed people need most. In New York, for example, GAO found that the New York City School District anticipates saving 14,000 jobs as a result of the Recovery Act funding. But there is also bad news. GAO found significant shortcomings in the targeting and tracking of Recovery Act spending. The Recovery Act places a priority on directing funds towards projects in economically distressed areas. However, there is substantial variations among states as to what constitute an economically distressed area. For this reason, it is unclear as to whether Recovery Act funds are going where they are needed most. This is particularly important with respect to transportation-related spending in distressed areas. Therefore, I, today I am requesting a personal meeting with the Secretary of Transportation to discuss the importance of ensuring that Recovery Act spending on highway and other transportation infrastructure projects is focused on these economically distressed areas. I believe this is one of the key ways in which we can help create real jobs and do it quickly. I want to note, however, that without appropriate guidance from the Office of Management and Budget and other federal agencies on spending and accounting for Recovery Act funds, it will be difficult to measure our true progress in creating jobs and in minimizing waste, fraud, and all abuse of Recovery Act funds. GAO found this to be a critical issue for New York and for other states as well. OMB's failure to provide timely and necessary guidance begs the question, are we asking the states to do the impossible? Can they really provide accurate and reliable data on Recovery Act spending and job creation by the October 10 reporting deadline? I look forward to hearing how OMB intends to resolve this problem. I also remain concerned that the states are being asked to administer a funding program of unprecedented size without being given the necessary resources. They have been asked to fix the car, but not given the mechanic or the tools to do so, or even the spare parts that is needed. And I see the GAO agrees with us that this is a serious problem. In fact, that's why I introduced H.R. 2182, of course, with the ranking member, Congressman Issa of California, 
Our bill increases the percentage of Recovery Act funds that may be used by states and localities in, to con conduct administrative and oversight functions. The House has passed H.R. 2182, but it has yet to be taken up in the Senate. I hope that one result of today's hearing and the release of the GAO's report is that it will reinforce the message to the Senate that this bill needs to be enacted as soon as possible. I would hope we can find ourselves in conference with the Senate prior to the August recess, at which time I also intend to address the single audit issues highlighted by GAO in its report. Both this Congress and the administration have instituted an unprecedented level of oversight designed to ensure transparency and accountability of Recovery Act spending. In doing so, we have committed to an enormous undertaking to deal with the toughest economic times this country has faced since the 1930s. I hope that our distinguished witnesses can help us identify what needs to be done, what lessons have been learned so far, and what best practices have been identified so that we can ensure that taxpayers' money is being used effectively and responsibly. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to your testimony. At this time, I yield time to the ranking member from California, Congressman Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing today. Mr. Chairman, uh, t just today, the uh, USA Today's headline read, sorry, I'm not good, okay, states aren't using stimulus funds as intended. Mr. Chairman, thank you to uh, your work on this issue. Uh, we were already well aware that uh, ultimately a great deal of the money delivered to the states has in fact been cost shifted to projects not originally intended and that our funds have gone toward maintenance of many jobs including, uh, as we will hear today, I'm sure, the retention of teachers or even retention bonuses to hold on to teachers. I will be interested today to hear from uh, the GAO and others how we score a job saved or created when in fact it goes to a retention bonus. Mr. Chairman, uh, when the government spends $787 billion in this make-work stimulus effort, it, <clears throat> in selling the stimulus package, the administration promised the American people that the legislation would create or save 3.5 million jobs and prevent the U.S. unemployment rate from rising above 8 percent. Mr. Chairman, I oppose the stimulus, and I might remind you it was the second stimulus having already tried handing out dollars under the previous administration. I voted for that stimulus. One might say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. In fact, I believe that the discredited uh, Keynesian economic theory behind the effort is misguided, and I am convinced that it won't work. Unfortunately, recent economic data has validated my opposition. The U.S. Un, uh, economy lost 433 net jobs in June, bringing the unemployment rate to 9.5 percent. These job losses come on the heels of other declining economic indicators that bring total American jobs lost since President Obama took office to 2.6 million. Mr. Chairman, I might remind you all those jobs lost are in the private sector. In fact, the public sector and particularly the federal government, has increased employment. We are, in fact, a job factory. As the committee uh, Democrats rightly, rightfully noted in their briefing memorandum, the purpose of the stimula stimulus was putting the unemployed, unemployed back to work. Mr. Chairman, these troubling job numbers have shown beyond a doubt that so far the stimulus has failed to do that. When Vice President Biden was asked to justify the administration's stimulus job promises in the face of economic reality, he admitted the administration, quote, misread the economy, unquote. The misreading, however, didn't stop the administration from touring the country, hyping success of stimulus efforts creating 150,000 jobs. These job claims are based on the same flawed macroeconomic models that the Vice President now admits 
were <clears throat> mistaken. The macroeconomic models also reflected, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, reflected the cleaver, the unaccountable measures of jobs saved. Since no one can possibly uh, dispute or disprove the job save claims of the administration, then in fact, we are by definition forced to say the jobs must be saved, but others were lost. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to dispute that the money was spent uh, by the administration in good faith in order to help the economy. Many of the, quote, down payments made on programs are in fact programs which the administration believes in the long run will do a great deal of good. Even the dollars sent in checks that ultimately ended up being deposited rather than spent were intended to be spent to help stimulate the economy. Uh, the OMB guidance fails to include today uh, a requirement for receipt of reports uh, be accessible to the public in raw data feed. That is one of the areas that I'm most concerned at and will be, will be asking, aren't the American people in this day and age in which we can Google and find out what the neighbor's house next door is worth, when it last sold, what it's appraised at, and when in fact it goes into escrow, why are we not in fact able to see when money was spent, no matter how spent, by the federal, state, or local governments? I look forward to discussing these issues today with OMB Deputy Director Rob Neighbors, and I thank him for appearing before this committee. I also look forward to hearing from uh, Mike Pickett, CEO of uh, Anviva, I'm very bad at it, a private sector uh, providing recovery.org. And I know my time is expiring, and I just want to uh, ask unanimous consent to put the rest of it in the record and take just one moment, uh, thank you, and take just one moment to note that we're going to see today uh, in, uh, in written testimony uh, that recovery.org, in fact, outperforms and is outused by the federal government's own recovery.gov. And I think that's very telling of what we're going to ask our first panel today, which is why is it government at greater expense cannot equal the private sector? And if we cannot e equal the private sector in providing information, then should we, in fact, simply dump our raw data and allow private sector companies to monetize it or pay them to make it available rather than to continue to invest countless tens of billions of dollars into IT infrastructure that always seems to look pretty and seldom delivers as promised. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll put the rest in for my record and thank you for your indulgence. Yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Issa. In addition to receiving uh, the testimony of the witnesses before us today, the committee has received statements for the record from the National Governors Association and the National Association of State Auditors, Controllers, and Treasurers. These organizations' financial support that the state needed to create and preserve uh, jobs. Of, of course, without objection, I entered th these written statements into the record. I will now, um, uh, we'll now turn to our panel of witnesses. It is. Uh, committee policy that all witnesses be sworn in. So if you raise your right hand and repeat after me, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. I do. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Our witnesses today. Mr. Gene Dodaro is the Acting Controller General of the United States and leads the Government Accountability Office. Under the Recovery Act, GAO was charged with tracking stimulus dollars to promote efficiency and track waste and fraud. And today, GAO is issuing its second bi-monthly report. Welcome, Mr. Dodaro. Uh, Mr. Rob Neighbors is the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Previously, Mr. Neighbors served the House as clerk and staff director of the Appropriations Committee. OMB is also monitoring stimulus spending and is responsible for implementing the transparency requirement of the Recovery Act, including providing guidance to states. At this time, I ask that each witness deliver their 
testimony within five minutes. I'm, I'm sure you've been here before, so, but I just want to sort of reemphasize, because every now and then we have to reemphasize this. <laughs> uh, the starts out with a green light. Then it goes to a yellow light. And then one minute later, there's a red light. Now, red light everywhere means stop. <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, Mr. Darrow, why don't you start? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Issa, members of the uh, committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's second bimonthly review of the use of Recovery Act funds by selected states and localities. In order to carry out our statutory responsibilities, we've selected 16 states and the District of Columbia uh, to review over the next uh, two to three years to do a longitudinal study of the use of the money by those localities, how they're safeguarding the money, and reporting on the impact. Now, these 17 jurisdictions will receive approximately two-thirds of the Recovery Act funds that will be flowing to these states and localities. Now, what, uh, one of the reasons we're doing a longitudinal study, as you can see from this chart here, while about $49 billion was estimated by CBO to flow to uh, the states and localities in 2009, the peak period for Recovery Act funds to be outlaid will be 2010, and 2011 will continue funds distributed to the states and localities and outlays. So the money will be distributed, approximately $280 billion will be going to the states and localities. So far of the $49 billion that was estimated to go to the states nationally, about $29 billion has been distributed uh, there as well. Now the character of the spending uh, is uh, shown for this fiscal year 2009 in this following chart. The predominant amount of money that will be outlaid uh, to the states and localities is in the Medicaid program where the federal government's matching share has been increased. Every state received an increase of 6.2 percent and then uh, additional increases based upon unemployment rates uh, in those states and localities. Among the 17 jurisdictions, ours range from uh, an increased federal share of 6.2 percent in Iowa up to 12.24 percent uh, in Florida. So far, the 16, uh, 17 jurisdictions that we looked at had drawn down $15 billion uh, in the Medicaid spending area, or about 86 percent of the approximately $17.5 billion that had been allocated to them through the third quarter of this fiscal year. They're using the money to maintain Medicaid uh, benefit levels and, and provide uh, services. Most of the states that we visited also had increased caseloads in the Medicaid area, and this has enabled them to be able to do that. The increased federal share also freed up state monies, potentially, that could be used in other areas and, and to help them with their fiscal stresses. The second area is the state stabilization fund. About 82 percent of that money is to be used for education purposes and distributed to local education. Uh, agencies or institutions of higher learning. 18 percent can be used uh, to stabilize public uh, services, particularly public safety, and could be they have more discretion on using the money. Uh, the 17 jurisdictions we visited had been uh, allocated by the Department of Education almost 17 billion dollars. So far they've drawn down 4.3 billion dollars or about 25 percent of the money that's been allocated. In the highway area uh, is the next area, largest area. Uh, the 17 jurisdictions we had received had been allocated about $15.5 billion. They've obligated about $9.2 billion or slightly over that, so about 59 percent of the money has been obligated. Now, obligated here means that the Federal uh, Department of Transportation and the state have agreed on the nature of the projects. The projects uh, in the localities we visited, there were about 2,600 projects that had been approved uh, already, most of them for paving roads or widening roads, uh, since that could be uh, allocated more quickly in the state's uh, opinion. Uh, so far, the way that program works is that states are reimbursed as they're making payments. So of the 17 localities, so far they've been reimbursed $96 million. So that money is beginning to 
go through the system, uh, but a lot more is obligated than has been uh, outlaid at this point in time. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we believe that the Secretary of Transportation in consultation with Secretary of uh, Commerce needs to clarify the economically distressed area uh, issue now before a lot of the money is spent, the remainder of, of the money. Uh, now, the Recovery Act funds have clearly helped states deal with fiscal stresses, but they've also increased the accountability requirements for the states. And we're concerned that under fiscal stress, the states have been cutting back on uh, some of their management and audit function areas, thereby reducing some of the safeguards. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Ice of the committee, we, we support passage of H.R. 2182. We think it's very much needed and in line with the recommendations uh, in our report, which is to really increase the utility of the single audit area, and I can talk more about that uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, also, there's greater uh, need, while OMB has taken important steps to clarify the guidance, additional clarifications needed and better communication uh, with the states is needed as well. And I'd be happy to elaborate on all these areas in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, and we look forward to continuing to support the Congress and their important oversight over the Recovery Act spending. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Nabus. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isa, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the status of our economic recovery and more particularly the Recovery Act's role in restoring sustainable economic growth to our country. To understand where we are, it's important to recognize just how dangerous a path our economy was on just a few months ago. We are, we are working on coming out of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. For the fourth quarter of 2008, the United States experienced a negative growth rate of 6.3 percent, the worst since the recession of 1982. Employment fell every month in 2008. The economy has lost a record 5.7 million jobs over the past, uh, past year and 6.5 million since the recession, recession began in December 2007. After a long and unprecedented boom, housing prices have fallen 11 percent since their peak in April 2007. And over that same period, residential investment has fallen by more than 40 percent. $9.8 trillion of wealth has been lost in the market. The financial crisis has choked off lending, contributing to further economic decline. And some of our most prominent businesses have closed, merged, or been forced to take drastic steps to stay afloat. In January and February, when Congress and the President worked in concert to approve the Recovery Act, all of us knew the economic situation was bad. None of us anticipated just how weak the economy truly was, though. The financial meltdown contributed mightily to this situation, but so did deficiencies in the foundation of our economic growth. Infrastructure, health care, education, and clean energy. When we have failing drinking water systems, crumbling roads and highways, substandard or non-existent broadband service, bridges that are graded as dangerous for travel, wastewater treatment plants in poor condition, schools that are overcrowded and falling apart, thousands of dams labeled as high hazard or unsafe, the picture is clear. While these deficiencies are not the only cause of the economic problems we face, it is a significant contributing factor. It places substantial strain on state and local governments and inhibits the ability of businesses to compete. From the moment he was elected, the President has put the economy front and center. Working with Congress, the administration has stabilized the financial market and started to see stabilization on housing. We are slowing the economic freefall. As a nation, we are moving from a long period of economic slowdown to a time of new industry, opportunity, and innovation. The Recovery Act is an important part of that effort. The Recovery Act is designed to help millions of families weather this downturn, create new jobs, and spark the engines of long-term growth. It's a work in progress, but it's steady progress. Just this month, eight days into July, the Department of Education is helping states with their increasing budgetary pressures by accelerating more than $2.7 billion in Recovery Act funds well ahead of schedule. The administration opened competition on more than $15 billion in high-speed rail, smart grid, and broadband programs. All 50 states obligated at least half of their highway funds before the July 1st deadline. And as a result, right now, there are more than 1,900 highway projects underway across the country. Also this month, the Department of Energy moved forward with more than $460 million for cutting-edge emission reduction projects, so it will be central to the nation's innovative clean energy future. The Interior Department pressed forward with another $134 million for critical water reclamation projects in the West. 
The Department of Veterans Affairs completed $500 million in recovery payments to approximately 1.9 million, million veterans and beneficiaries to help them keep pace with their bills. Overall, more than 20,000 Recovery Act projects have been approved. Almost $201 billion of all Recovery Act funding has been obligated or distributed. These are many of the things on which the Recovery Act focuses. But more importantly, the Recovery Act invests in people. Within a few weeks of the Act becoming law, we implemented the broadest tax cut in history. The Recovery Act provided $288 billion in tax cuts and incentives to families and businesses. We extended and expanded unemployment benefits and medical coverage for people who are still looking for work. We have modified the first-time home buyer's tax credit so it can be used for a down payment or closing cost, helping to stabilize the housing market. And to date, nearly 1.1 million new homeowners have claimed the $8,000 credit. And the Recovery Act does more, focusing on improving the skills and abilities of the American people so we can build better products more efficiently and effectively. That means improved schools and teachers, specialized training for cutting edge industries, and financial help for those men and women ready to start their own businesses. The American people know that getting out of the economic hole will not be easy or quick. And they also, know, they also have every right to know that these investments are making a difference. To that end, the administration has put forward an unprecedented transparency effort that is reliable, accurate, and open. This has never been done before at the federal level. Beginning in October, as Congress mandated, the American people will be able to see how dollars are being spent in their local community, who is getting the funds, for what projects, and when will the project be finished, and what is the benefit to the community. The Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, led by Earl Devaney, has the responsibility to track how dollars are being spent. OMB is working in full partnership with the board to make sure that the dollars are invested smartly and to stop waste, fraud, and abuse. Our mission is simple. Fund projects that can make a difference today with new jobs and opportunities while building strength for the economy for many years to come. Is this easy? No. Is our work complete? Not even close. But we are on the right path. Last month, the economy lost 467,000 jobs. And let's be very clear about this. 460,000 jobs lost in a month is 467,000 jobs too many but it's much slower than the pace that we saw in the first quarter when the average monthly job loss was 691,000 jobs. We are making progress, but we still have a long way to go. A 9.5% unemployment rate is, is not acceptable. Neither are the daily Mr. struggles Neighbors, could you and hard summarize, decisions. You, could you summarize yes. your time is up? Uh, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you, and I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you very, very much. Um, we will now... Um, move to the question period. Uh, each member will have five minutes and of course you know, I will um, begin. Mr. Dodaro, has the act helped to lessen the financial burden on states or are we currently in a wait and see mode? In terms of the current financial uh, crisis in the, in the states? I'm, I'm sorry, yes. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Has uh, the act helped to lessen the financial burden on states? Uh, are we, is it too early to tell? No, I, I think it's clear that the Recovery Act has helped in accomplishing one of its objectives, which was to help stabilize state and local government budgets. I mean, states are under fiscal stress. If I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a chart that I brought here in anticipation of his question. If, if you look at the solid line, this is the estimated path of the federal government's annual deficit. And you can see it's on a downward trajectory under current expectations. And this chart hasn't been fully updated yet because we're using state data. If you look at the trajectory for state governments in the aggregate in terms of their fiscal condition to the federal government, you get the dotted line on the bottom, which means that the states and localities are on the same uh, unfortunate trajectory that the federal government is with regard to a, pr a protracted period of time of deficit uh, situation. So I think, and you can see the drop in 2009 there in the beginning, and we report in our uh, uh, latest update that the state revenue projections are falling short in virtually every state uh, due to the uh, economic recovery. But this is not a, a short-term phenomenon, uh, we believe, with the states and local governments. And there's a long-term structural problem with federal government's financing as well. So 
But in the short term, the Recovery Act is helping the states deal uh, with their fiscal stresses. But we haven't seen the full story here that will unfold over the next few years. Right. Now, the 16 different states measuring the progress uh, of the implementation of the Recovery Act. In your opinion, what is the greatest difficulty that may prevent states from being ready to report on October the 10th? What do you see as a problem? I, I think uh, the states face the same challenges that the federal government faces in that the uh, time uh, objectives here, the timeliness of the reporting and the accuracy and the completeness of the reporting will be a stretch goal uh, for the states as well as it will be uh, for the federal departments and agencies. Now, I think OMB in their latest guidance has made a good step to clarify a number of areas on, regarding the reporting area. They've given some guidelines on data uh, that's required and what formats. So I think that that's a good step in the right direction. We've made some recommendations for OMB to continue to work with the states to clarify some of the reporting guidance, give some examples of how it's to be implemented. But I think underlying it all is the timeliness of the reporting and the accuracy and completeness of the reporting. I see that as the biggest challenge, and that's why we recommended increased uh, support on the part of the federal government to help with the oversight structures in the states. Right. Let me ask you this, Mr. Neighbors. Um, how great is the risk of inaccurate job creation and preservation numbers? Could you repeat that question, yeah. sir? Well, let me, let me ask another one first. Um, June guidance, the definition of a full-time job is basically left up to the states and other entities receiving Recovery Act dollars. How great is the risk of inaccurate job creation and preservation numbers? I, I think with all of our data collection efforts, we're very concerned. Your mic on? Uh, yes. I think with, with all of our data collection efforts, we are very sensitive about the, the possibility of incorrect or inaccurate uh, data. One of the things that we are planning on doing in order to follow up with state and local governments, in part uh, based on recommendations from GAO and in part based on comments and concerns that we've heard from the, the, from the Hill and, and from the states, is we are planning on doing a series of web-based seminars so that we can walk through with the states exactly what we are looking for in terms of the, the various reporting requirements that we have to help clarify exactly what we intend to do and what we expect them to report with regard to all of the data elements uh, due in October. Yeah. Can you be specific? When exactly do you uh, expect to have that? Uh, we, we are actually planning, I believe, to announce today uh, that uh, the specific dates on the web-based seminars, and that will be occurring in the, uh, the next few weeks. Uh, your time is up, y'all. Just re be advised me if I have to respect the red light too. My staff just said, <laughs> "Thank you very much." I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Issa. Mr. Chairman, you know now that uh, the uh, gentleman, the uh, Capitol Hill policeman who used to occupy uh, C Street, has retired, you could in fact be known as the red light king, replacing him. <laughs> uh, but I thank you for your holding us all to that high standard. Uh, that's an inside thing for those of us who tried to cross at that street over the years. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Neighbors, uh, quick question. Uh, if the governors we're going to speak to later, if, if they issue a retention bonus, uh, in other words, new dollars, additional dollars to retain state employees, is that a job retained, those dollars, in your opinion? I would have to look at expi ex explicitly what they are doing, but I would not necessarily include it as a, a, okay, a so job. Okay, so you'll come back to us with a written answer whether you're discounting Absolutely, that. Absolutely, sir. Now, the American people are not enjoying cost of living increases for the most part. As a matter of fact, it, in many cases, their pay is going down. If a state uses stimulus money to support a cost of living increase across the board for state employees, would you discount that? Because if they didn't receive it, and chose to do a, a freeze on cost of living increases, wouldn't they, in fact, have retained every job while not spending our money? Well, it's, it's not clear that Recovery Act dollars can be used specifically for that purpose. All money is fungible, Mr. Neighbors. The question, very specifically, because I need to know your standard if I'm going to appreciate the numbers that you say are so hard to get. If, in fact, 
the assumption is that states are not using money for cost of living increases, but they do cost of living increases, isn't that reasonable to discount off the jobs saved? Since not doing cost of, not doing cost of living income uh, increase is likely not to lead to mass losses in a 10, 11, 12 percent unemployment, depending upon the state. I, I think that is a, a fair. Okay. Well, I'd appreciate when your numbers come back, if you'd address those two issues of whether they were calculated in or out. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dodaro, uh, your chart there, uh, like most people who got business degrees, we were required to take stats, and we hated it. But the one thing I learned about statistics and a curve like that is that if you begin the start date at a particular time, any curve can look like almost anything. That curve begins when? It's since it's so I, far away. I think it's uh, 2008. It's two, 2008. It's, it's 2009, isn't it? Uh, 2009 is the second data point where you, where, you, where you see the drop off, correct? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, it's two, 2000, it starts at 2005, uh, and then uh, the drop, the next data point is 2009. Okay, so 2000 and, and the, the big dip, what is that big dip year? The, bi the big dip is the effect of the recession uh, on, on revenues, both at the federal government level and at the state government level, and in addition, uh, the additional federal uh, expenditures uh, for both the uh, stability for the banking system as well as the economic stimulus. So, it, so it, it's, it's the net effect. This is the net deficit uh, figures. Okay. I wanted to understand that because it, it, is, it is an unusual chart to see. Uh, Mr. Neighbors, uh, I, was, uh, I was very interested in your testimony, and particularly a statement, which I'll, I'll read quickly, that says, since almost all states have to balance their fiscal budgets, even in the face of recessions, 40 have cut benefits and services, which is why I prompted the first question, 28 have raised taxes, and more are considering both measures. These actions deepen the impact of the downturn, but the cuts and tax increases would have been much larger without the Recovery Act. Now, it seems like you're saying tax increases are bad there. Is that true? Uh, I think in a, at a ter in a time of an economic recession, we believe that we should try to avoid uh, additional tax increases. Okay, so you join me in, in saying that the tax increases with cap and trade last week were probably a bad idea in Congress at a time of deep recession. I, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily agree with oh, that. Oh, so you're, you're out of step with the administration in this statement. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll take it as, as appropriate that, in fact, uh, tax increases uh, should be avoided. But I do have a question. When you say 40 have cut benefits and services and more are considering both measures, just taking the benefits and services is my final question. Uh, at a time when there's 10 percent unemployment, at a time when the burden and the deficits, is it your opinion and the administration's opinion that these deficit or these cuts are inappropriate, or is it your opinion that states should look for opportunities to cut any program that is not essential in their services? Well, I think the, the president has been very clear at the federal level, and we would uh, we would look at this at the state and local level as well. Is that? inefficient programs should always be reduced or, or cut. I think that the concern that we have right now is that the chief problem facing the economy is a, is a demand uh, problem. We need, to have, we need to ensure that there's appropriate amounts of good spending going on in the economy to make sure that the demand uh, is increased so that econ economic growth can actually occur. Uh, what we are concerned about is that because of the balanced budget amendments in various states, that states are making unwise choices right now simply to balance their budget, not based on the, the relative success or failures of particular programs. Thank you. And thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Giordano, let me ask you this. Um, one, you were talking a little bit earlier about you showed the chart, you were pointing to the chart and showing how the federal situation, economic situation is, and then comparing it to the states. Mr. Mm -hmm. Neighbors just mentioned something that's so significant. States, uh, many of them, I guess all of them, uh, most of them have some kind of requirement that they have a balanced budget. That's right. a real problem, isn't it? 
Well, it's definitely because making trying to make this comparison is when they are trying to balance a budget, and they've got to have one. Right. That it's kind of an unfair comparison, isn't it? Well, it's it. Uh, we're not trying to compare it mm -hmm. from the standpoint of saying that it's not a difficult challenge. In fact, you know, most of the states and the discussions we've had with them, and I have a lot of contact with state auditors as well, what we're trying to illustrate is that the states are going to be under fiscal stress. So the, the, yes. the challenge for them to balance their budget right now is difficult, and it will be difficult for the foreseeable future based on these trends. So we're, we're trying to just uh, illustrate it that they have a, a significant challenge ahead of them that's similar to the federal government's challenge in dealing with its deficit. And so situation. governors play a very significant role in this process, is that right? That's definitely true. And on that note, um, very, I know our governor from Maryland will be testifying shortly, uh, Governor O'Malley, who's done an outstanding job uh, with regard to this stimulus program. But let me, speaking of governors, Mr. Neighbors, in Governor Rendell's written testimony, I don't know if you've seen it, but he comments on behalf of the National Governors Association, Governor Rendell expressed concern that governors are not informed when Recovery Act funds are sent from a federal agency directly to recipients located within their state. For instance, the Department of Housing and Urban Development approves and sends funding directly to local public housing authorities. GAO recommended uh, in its April 2009 report, and again, in their report today that OMB takes steps to notify states of such funds flowing into a state. Mr. Dardaro, Dardaro just said that governors play a significant role. We'll have three of them in here in a few minutes. The question becomes, why has not GAO uh, taken on those recommendations and done that? Well, I, I think as we continue to work on developing our relationships with the, our state and local partners and, uh, and with our governors, we are looking at the mechanisms by which we can do that. We take the GAO's recommendations very seriously, and I think going into the, the future, you'll see us do a better job of in, informing the governors when, when those types of allocations are made. Is that a very, is that a, I take it that now that you made that twice, GAO, uh, I guess that's something very significant. Is that right? Yeah, yes, uh, 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 Congressman Cummings. The, the reason it's important is that the states are going to be in a position to make decisions themselves on how to fund money at the local level. And if they don't know what federal money is going directly to the localities, there could be some duplication, there could be gaps. And also, I think they feel some level of responsibility for understanding the full impact. Uh, of the program. So we think it's very important. We're going to continue to keep making the recommendations until it gets Well, no, 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 no. You can't yeah. keep making recommendations yeah. and they not be followed. Right. Uh, and I would suggest, Mr. Neighbors, that uh, you adopt the President's words, the urgency of now, because we are holding these governors responsible, and if they don't even know what's going on with regard to money coming into their states, I think that's very unfair to them, very unfair. And I think we want to be most effective and efficient with these funds, and we don't want folks saying that they're not being used properly. So basically what happens is that they don't know where the, where the money is going. Uh, they can say, well, we don't know. We, we don't want that position. And now, and I, and I guess the reason why I'm spending so much time on this is that the recommendation has already been made twice, and we're still talking about, we're thinking about it, we're trying to figure it out. No, 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 time out. We got to do it. Well, Mr. Cummings, let me be clear on this then. Uh, I've heard what you've said, and we will go back and we will find a way to implement that recommendation. So do we have a deadline then? Can we set a deadline? Because around here, you could be next year doing it. It's not going to be next year. Um, I need to go back and talk to our technical folks and figure out, but you will receive a phone call from me, and I will tell you specifically how we are doing it and when we are doing it. Would you it. give it in writing to the chairman, please? I would be happy to do Thank so. You. Mr. Deridato and Mr. Neighbors, there, are, there have been reports that the Department of Transportation, specifically Federal Highway Infrastructure Investment Programs, are running much smoother and quicker than many of the other programs under the Recovery Act. Can you comment on this observation? What exactly has DOT done differently from other federal agencies, and how can DOT's best practices be implemented across other agencies that uh, may have greater challenges? Mr. Dardaro. Uh, uh, first, I would say, I mean, the Department of Transportation has a set program that's been in existence for a number of years, and so they're following that same basic federal program. So they, they really have not had to uh, make that many adjustments 
for the recovery so act. So they basically purposes. were already set to go. Right. Okay. Right. Right. And so these other programs have not. They have sort of had to create. Yeah, some something of them to use I, the money. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, some of the programs, like the state stabilization fund, is brand new. I mean, that's a brand new effort. The Medicaid matching I, has gone smoothly as well. So I'm, I, I wouldn't want to say that the highway program is the only program that's operated effectively. Where there have been existing programs in place, they've carried out their normal processes, and that's helped uh, to uh, distribute the money quicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, now you have five minutes to Mr. Turner of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, thank you for holding this important hearing and the important issue that we have facing us today. And uh, Mr. Neighbors, Mr. Dodaro, I want to thank you for being here and the, the tough work that you have. Uh, for both of you, I know that, that everyone wants this money to be spent wisely. Uh, they want this money to be spent in a way that moves the economy forward and in a way that, that creates jobs. Uh, now, personally, I, I voted against the stimulus dollars. Uh, and I voted against them because I thought that the purpose was not well defined, uh, that it would create a lot of waste, and that there would be spiraling deficits. So in knowing what the framework is, was of the original bill and the authorization of these dollars, I personally believe that your job is that much more difficult to try to fashion out of, of the stimulus package uh, funding and um, approval for projects that will actually achieve its goal, and, and we want you to be successful in, in that goal. Um, Mr. Neighbors, I, I was looking at your written testimony, and uh, you have told us that the role of the Office of Management and Budget is to coordinate the nuts and bolts of the Recovery Act implementation within the executive branch and make sure that these implementation efforts are consistent with the Act's mission and the President's priorities. So today my question to you is going to be pretty important and goes directly to what your responsibilities are even in your testimony. Uh, I represent the 3rd District of Ohio and in that district um, a, a company that had been uh, located in our district with its corporate headquarters for over 100 years NCR recently made an announcement that it would be relocating uh, to Georgia, to some suburbs around Atlanta, Georgia, and communities around, around Atlanta. News reports indicate that uh, Columbus, Georgia, plans to use stimulus dollars as part of the implementation package for the relocation dollars that were offered to NCR to move these jobs from Ohio to Georgia. Now, as you know, Ohio's economy has been significantly impacted. Uh, hundreds and thousands of jobs are being lost throughout Ohio. And this corporate headquarters has 1,200 jobs that will be moving from my community to Georgia. Obviously, um, you know, my community is, is very upset about the prospects of stimulus dollars, dollars that, in fact, they will have to pay for, being used to fund the relocation of jobs from their community uh, to another. Now, I believe this is a nonpartisan issue. The governor of Georgia is a Republican. Governor of Ohio is a Democrat. Governor of Ohio thinks this is the wrong thing to do. I'm assuming the governor of Georgia thinks this is the right thing to do. I'm a Republican. Our president is a Democrat. I believe that three out of four of those ought to believe that this is the wrong use of stimulus dollars. So my question to you, Mr. Neighbors, who, the individual who fashions the guidance and implementation is, is this an appropriate and allowable expense under the stimulus guidelines? And once the administration knows that a state or community intends to use stimulus dollars to, in effect, buy or steal jobs from one community to another, how do you stop it? How, Mr. Neighbors, can you ensure the people of Ohio that their stimulus dollars, their tax dollars that they're going to have to pay back with interest, are not being used to merely move jobs from one state to another? Well, let me answer your first question first. I, I, I don't have this. Your mic. Your mic. I don't have this. Your mic. Is this better? Yeah. I don't have the specifics on this example, but it is disturbing. Uh, Based on what you've just said, it, that does not sound like an appropriate use of recovery dollars. Uh, as the ranking member has pointed out, dollars are fungible, and I would like to get smarter about exactly what dollars were used to do, to, to do what. Uh, with regard to your second question, and, and, but before I leave, let me say that I will follow up on, on this specific example. I will, talk to, uh, I will talk to our general counsel, and I will talk to people in, in, at OMB to find out specifically what happened in this case. Uh, with regard to what tools uh, OMB and the administration has with regard to the way specific dollars are, are spent, 
uh, there, are, there have been various instances that have come up through the last four months where we have expressed concern about the way certain states or certain local communities uh, have proposed to use their funds. In certain instances, we believe that we actually have the authority to stop the use of, the, of those funds, and we've exercised that use. In other instances, uh, based on the existing statutes and the existing legal authorities, we've had less of an ability to stop the funds, but we've, made it, we've tried to make it very clear that we do not think that, that is an appropriate use of Recovery Act dollars and goes against the spirit of the dollars, and I think the, the Vice President has been very clear in those types of instances. I'd like to go back and look at this example more specifically and be able to get back to you on that. I really appreciate that. I'll give you a copy as you leave, also a copy of a June 3rd letter that myself and the, the um, minority leader um, John Boehner sent to the President detailing this issue when it came to light, when the announcement was made in the news media uh, by officials in Georgia of their intent to use these dollars. We have not received a response to this yet. Uh, I would appreciate uh, your attention to it. We will do. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, General Accountability Office, Mr. Dodaro, uh, indicated that in Massachusetts, in the Boston school officials noted a difference between the guidance that the Department of Education was giving and the goal that was in the Recovery Act. The goal in the Recovery Act on education funding is job creation. And the guidance that the Department of Education was giving was that districts should invest those one-time funds thoughtfully to minimize the funding cliff that would occur once the funds are no longer available. So I want to ask each of you a question on that, especially since the Title I funds are said by the Education Department to be only limited for limited purposes. So, Mr. Neighbors, what's your impression of that sort of con seemingly a contradiction on that? Well, I, I think that the, the bridge between the contradiction is that uh, we always view the Recovery Act as being a short-term effort. The President has been very clear that we need to get the economy jump-started. Uh, we need to expend uh, resources now to, to actually get that started. But over the long term, uh, the funding levels that are contained within uh, uh, the Recovery Act should not be thought of as permanent. And what we are asking states to do is to do the things necessary to maintain the employment uh, that they have currently. But at the end of the day, they can't count on these funds being here in 2011, 2012, 2013. Uh, this is a short-term stimulus program in order to jumpstart the economy. All right, I'm not sure I see the bridge. Let me ask you, Mr. Dodaro, I mean, yeah. what do you propose states do uh, in order to meet those two criteria, one, the job, of, uh, job creation, uh, and the other of making sure that they spend the money so as they don't have a uh, falling off of the cliff, so to speak, when the money is no longer available? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the Act gives great flexibility to the states in order to do that. In a number of areas, there are multiple objectives, often, as you're pointing out, and we're pointing out some of the officials, conflicting objectives, or, some, or objectives, rather, and some tensions between what to do. And I think it depends on the specific circumstances of the, of the state and local levels in, in order to, to understand what would be the best use of the money from their perspective. And if they have questions, what we've urged is greater communication between the federal departments and agencies and the state and local governments. So I, I think, you know, some states are having a lot of fiscal stress right now that they would have to lay off teachers, whatever. I, I think they're in a different situation than other states that aren't in that situation. Uh, but they have to balance these objectives. I, th I think what they're doing is having trouble balancing the objectives. What I, we're I looking agree. for on the question was a little guidance here. What they're finding is right. that there was one intent that was the money was to be used to retain jobs. And the other intent is that just means that the next year twice as many jobs are going to have to go uh, by the by because the money has gone, uh, then they haven't really used the money for a long-term purpose. Right. Uh, neither one of you have seemed to be able to meet that, uh, that crossover there of how they deal with both of those issues. But if you think about it a little bit and want to share something, sure. I'd be happy to share it with my districts who are in that dilemma yeah. and appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Neighbors, on the reporting and transparency aspect of it, we've had some communication with your office on, on the idea that you do require in your guidelines uh, that when the money goes from the federal to the state government, that's all reportable. When it goes from the federal government to a city or town, that's reportable. Uh, but you don't require in your guidelines that if the city or town then puts it out to a contractor and subcontractor, that that information is reported as well. The statute allows for that. When do you think your guidelines 
uh, will push a little further down to make that uh, mandatory? Well, we've done two things. The first thing that our guidance did in, in, in response to some of the concerns that you've raised is we, we did push the, the system as much as we thought we could do right now, and we are collecting vendor information from, from the subrecipients at, at this point. So to the extent that uh, cities are, are hiring vendors, for example, in weatherization types of activities, we'll, we will be capturing uh, that type of information. We are also uh, designing our systems such that uh, in the future, as we get better information from state and local governments, we will have the capacity to grow our systems to collect that subcontract information. Well, right now, you only require the identity of the vendor. Correct. Right? But it, wouldn't it be useful to have not only the identity of the vendor, but also the amount of money that they receive uh, and uh, the location of where that vendor is and those types of things? Those are, those are all things that we are looking at uh, possibly expanding. We thought that the, the, in talking to the recovery board, the thing that they emphasized to us the most was, please don't let the, the audit trail go cold. We, we at least need the identity. And we thought that from what we've heard from, uh, from a number of, of smaller communities in particular, this information is, is very hard to track normally. So even getting, maintaining just the vendor names was going to be difficult. But in terms of ensuring that the federal government, GAO, the recovery board, the IGs, have the ability to follow the money chain, that getting the vendor's name was absolutely critical. We're starting with that, but that's not going to be the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to Mr. Chaffet from Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And thank you both for being here. I know you care deeply about our country and want to do what's best for the United States of America, and we appreciate that. But I do have some questions, uh, particularly, Mr. Neighbors, if, if I could. How, how many jobs have been created? Uh, based on the last estimate that we have done, the Recovery Act created 150,000 jobs. And where, how do you come up with that number? Well, at this point, what we are, we are doing is we are using a, uh, an economic model uh, created by the, uh, by the CEA. Uh, the, the, spe the specifications behind that model are similar to the specifications that, uh, that we developed in terms of describing the impact that the Recovery Act would have when we, when we were for first pushing for the Recovery in, Act. In the essence of time, if perhaps that formula, if you could share with us in writing what that formula is and how you achieve that, I'd be fascinated. Uh, well, I believe it. that the CEA report is actually online, but we'll share it with, uh, with the committee. And, and how many jobs have been saved? Oh, the, we, we do not make a distinction between the jobs created and jobs saved. Why not? Uh, I think that it becomes increasingly difficult from a macro level to, to make that determination. What we, what we are able to say is, based on looking at what we believe the trends of the economy are, we can, we can say, uh, we can compare what the Recovery Act is doing and how many jobs currently exist versus what we were predicting would, okay, would so exist. Okay, so if you look over at this chart here, right, the goal was jobs, jobs, jobs. Yes. And you look at that unemployment number, and you claim that we are slowing the free fall how can you justify that number? Well, I, I think, let me start with uh, two points. We're not happy with the unemployment number. The unemployment number is I, something I that we that. find unacceptable. I understand that, but my question is, how do you justify saying that you're slowing the free fall? Well, I think that what we would do is we would look back at the, the job loss that we saw in the first quarter, which was approaching 700,000 jobs a month, and look at where we are right now. We're not happy with the job loss that we're happy. seeing right uh, now. We're not happy either, but the projections that the administration put forward and what would happen and not happen if we did or didn't do the stimulus are dramatic. They're unacceptable. We believe that the job loss is unacceptable as well. Now, and the president's quoted as saying that the stimulus has, quote, done its job. Is that true or not true? We believe that the stimulus has had the impact that we, we predicted, which is job creation. The, st the vice president, I think it was just yesterday, said that it hasn't had the impact that it was I, I think what the president said w w is accurate. The president has made it clear that... That it has or ha it has done its job? The president has said two things. One, he has said that... We did not have full, under, uh, full information at the time concerning the, the growth of the economy, and two, that the Recovery Act has had an impact in putting people back to work. I, I still do not understand how you can justify that it's, quote, slowing the free fall. Uh, let me ask you this. On page three of your written testimony, you, re you said, the Recovery Act extends or expands programs like unemployment insurance. Does unemployment insurance create or save a job? 
Unemployment insurance ensures that people have money to... But it, 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 I, I recognize there are benefits to it, but the question is, does it create or save a job? We believe that any dollar spent in the federal system will create or save a job because what is, what's going on is we are putting dollars into people's pocket to spur demand. What about Social Security income and FMAP? Because the, the rest of your quote here is, these programs account for about 29% of total Recovery Act funds. If 29% of the Recovery Act funds are being used for these three things that you cite, Yes. And Do we they directly create or save a job? They directly put money into the economy so that demand can be increased. Absolutely. But they do not dollar for dollar create or save a job. I, I, don't, I don't see how you can say that because every dollar spent, when you go to a store and spend a dollar, that is a dollar more that the business will have in terms of profits in, in order to either ensure that a business doesn't shut down or to hire, to hire new staff. My time is short here. Going to the very end of your testimony on page 11, second to last paragraph, Mr. Chairman, we know that in times of economic crisis, the government did not make the solutions. Rather, government gave the American people the tools to fix what was broken. What tools have you given the American people to fix what's broken? I think that what we are doing is the following. One, we are, we are ensuring that in the short term that people who are out of work uh, or who are facing difficult economic situations have the resources uh, in order to sustain uh, their current existence. The second thing that we are doing is we are putting, uh, we are creating job opportunities through infrastructure projects and the like to make sure that there are jobs for what, people. What tools are we giving the American people to fix what is broken? And third, we are providing tax relief in the short term, the, the broadest tax cut in American history through the Making Work Pay. Tax. I would happen to agree with you that tax yeah. relief is probably the number one thing that we can do to stimulate the economy and get people back to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Um, we now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, um, members of the committee, I wasn't here for this vote, for this package, um, so it's easy to second guess or use hindsight. Uh, I just don't think it's appropriate. Um, watching from afar, it was easy to understand the exigency of what was taking place, the extraordinary circumstances that haven't been seen in 80 years in this country, probably from a financial point of view. Um, so uh, I also think it's important to recognize the obvious that beyond the attempt at laser point precision of how many jobs were created or retained, it is what is being said here today um, is that it had more than one purpose. And it's also important to recognize that previous administrations have attempted uh, often to calculate the number of jobs created or retained with their programs. It has been borne out that that is extraordinarily difficult to do. So, gentlemen, I recognize that. Having said all that and recognize that this program needs to, uh, to uh, move forward, I do have concerns that to a large extent at the state level we're flying blind. Uh, you yourselves have talked about their cutbacks from auditors and people who would be, I guess, called fiscal watchdogs, uh, given the vast amounts of dollars and the, and the speed of which it had to go out. What's your best guess on time frame to do the things you started talking about? Clarification on rules, uh, Internet access, which was talked about in the GAO report, uh, improved communication, and a specific understanding of what the states can and can't do. Both, both of you would be great. Well, I'll, I'll start with our recommendations. There, there's a process in place uh, called the Single Audit Act that was passed in 1984, and it's a, a primary accountability vehicle for overseeing state use of federal funds that have been provided along with states' use of money. The, the single audit legislation could be modified here and guidance put out to make it a more effective, timely tool for Recovery Act purposes. From our perspective at GAO, this is a potential huge missed opportunity unless the guidance is changed to require earlier reporting. If, if I might put up the chart on a distribution of funds, please. It, what this chart shows, Congressman, is that a lot of the money at the state and local level, not, not that one, the, uh, excuse me, the one by, by year, shows that most of the 
uh, outlays to the states and, and localities will occur in 2010 and 2011. So there is an opportunity to look at what controls are going to be in place over those monies up front through the Single Audit Act. But it needs to, the guidance needs to be modified and the auditors need to be funded to do the work. This is a very important investment, could pay big dividends down the road. Uh, secondly, there is a need for continual uh, dialogue between OMB and the states to communicate uh, with the states and provide them information, particularly on the amount of money going directly to the localities in their state, not going through the state entities. Uh, and thirdly, uh, there needs to be some flexibility given to states to make sure that they have the proper systems and the proper people and the safeguards on the management side, on the programs that are being funded to have adequate management oversight. So strengthening those things are important. Are you talking about dictating that? Uh, I'm talk talking about, uh, in part, giving requirements for early internal control reporting and funding them. But unless that's done, uh, OMB has certain flexibilities administratively. Some of this could be done legislatively. H.R. 2182 uh, is important that's, uh, that that gets passed as well. But so it, would, it would appear that there's almost no ramifications for not following the rules, A, because the rules seem um, loose or, or not tight enough, uh, and B, because there's no actual restrictions or what will happen if you don't use the money in the way we describe. Yeah, th there are some areas where if money's not obligated, it can be redirected, for example, in the highway area, but most states have met those requirements. So there are, and there are some maintenance of effort requirements that the states maintain their spending both for highways and education. We are following those requirements to make sure that they are met going forward. But uh, it, it, by and large, uh, your point is right. And that is why it is important to have these safeguards in place. We are we're very sensitive about the concerns that GAO has raised. And for the most part, we uh, agree. We are supportive of the chairman and the ranking member's bill to increase the, uh, the funding that would be available for administrative types of activities. And we are looking at the, to what extent we can, uh, we can relieve some of that pressure administratively. Uh, I think that we want to continue to explore options with regard to single audit. We believe that the single audit is a key component of appropriate oversight. We do have some concerns about how quickly and effectively we can uh, we can shrink the reporting deadlines, but it's something that we want to work very closely with GAO and state auditors. With regard to communications, uh, uh, we couldn't agree more with the comments that GAO has made or that the, the committee has made. Uh, the state and local governments are our partners. Um, every day we are trying to improve our communications. It's not something where traditional mechanisms have, have worked. And so we are exploring new options, such as doing more work through the Internet and, and uh, making ourselves available to conferences, the NCSL, the uh, NGA, wherever we can find opportunities to communicate directly with our state and local partners, we're going to take advantage of those uh, efforts. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And if, and if yep. someone Jim. could, as we follow up, talk about the Internet a little bit more. Right. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, neighbors, uh, you know, Patrick and I are sailors. And there's, if you look at the course, the, basically the graph off uh, over here to your left, um, and look at it as being a course that is projected by a navigator as opposed to the course that is actually steered. According to that course, our navigator was 80 degrees off course from what was projected by the administration to what really happened was 80 degrees off. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not so sure I would get on a ship or a boat with a navigator with that kind of navigation skills. So the projected course of our economy, our job market, and the actual course were 80 degrees off. Now, do you really think that is an example for the future that the same navigator ought to be used in the future? Or do we got to go back and take a look at who predicted the course that we were setting? Because it definitely wasn't anywhere close to the course that we've, we've taken. Well, sir, 
I'm not a sailor, so I wouldn't get on any boat with me, <laughs> but with regard specifically to the economic uh, projections, what I would say is that the projections that the administration made at the time were fully consistent with the Federal Reserve Board, outside economic analysts, people like Mark Zandi, uh, and uh, private sector analysts. What happened was a was something that was unpredicted by any of the observers at the time. Okay. In other words, the experts were all wrong and had no idea what they were talking about at the time. Because obviously, we're talking a right-hand turn being made or a lack of a right-hand turn when you're predicting that we were going to take a hard to starboard. And we just kept, you know, full bore, right, basically the pattern we were going otherwise and did not see any change in the course set by the job market after we committed a trillion dollars in, in stimulus. I think, I think the general uh, economic consensus was that the economy was going to be bad. I don't think anybody predicted it was going to be as bad as it was. Okay. So we accept that the experts didn't know what the hell they were talking about at the time they predicted this. I think predicting economic performance is always difficult. 150,000 jobs created or saved. Um, how much money have we spent? Based on the uh, based on the most recent uh, information that we have, uh, we have obligated fifty-seven billion dollars. And how much is that per job? Anybody? I can do the math real quick, but I haven't uh, I haven't done the, the calculation completely. Okay, I would uh, I think that is least if we're going to claim, and it's kind of interesting the way we work this thing, and because the credibility of this administration is going to be threatened if we do not come up with the facts and justifications to the people. We've already saw what happened before with the previous administration. When you didn't have people that were willing to call down the previous administration for making statements they couldn't verify, we want to make sure the new administration doesn't fall into that same trap, because credibility means a lot during these crises. And right. frankly, with this navigation course, this promise that was made um, five months ago or three months ago or six months ago and then seeing what reality is. You see why the, the average citizen doesn't believe the so-called experts in Washington, including the new administration, if that's the kind of results we're going to have. I, like to, I think that we need to justify how much money we're spending and where are the jobs saved and where have they been preserved. And I think that we've got major major credibility crisis here. And I just think that we just can't continue to say it it de just because you keep saying it doesn't make it right and doesn't make it the truth. And the American people are sophisticated enough to know that Washington has a, um, is not going to be um, able to sell its bill of goods while you end up with a failure rate of over 50 percent when you're going to hard to port when you're saying you're going hard to starboard. No man in the world would get on a, a ship or a ship of state and follow this navigation for the future. So I think that we need to straighten this out. I yield back, Mr. Would Chairman. gentlemen yield? I yield. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Neighbors, I just have one follow-up question on the gentleman, and I, too, am not a sailor, so I won't go that way. How many jobs are created when you obligate money? The, uh, the CEA ob uh, estimates that a, uh, roughly $92,000 of government spending equals one job. Okay. Uh, but let me go through that. I mean, I understand if, if, I, if I start handing out $92,000, I can get a lot of people to work for me for a year uh, each. But when you obligate, don't you create no jobs? And when you spend, you create a job. I mean, obligating is an interesting term because it's, it's the amount that, in fact, is dispersed that creates a job, at least for that day. Isn't that right? That, that obligating alone creates no job? That is correct. We have obligated $158 billion, and we have outlaid, actually spent, uh, about $57 billion. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Right, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Hi. Um, let's see. I, I have a specific question um, uh, regarding the weatherization <laughs> formula. And it's my understanding that there's a formula that, that allocates funds among different states. And I was wondering, do you have, have you been able to develop an opinion whether that formula is actually all right in the sense of um, you're, you're actually um, putting weatherization funds into areas where you're going to save BTUs? And as a follow-on to that, um, is there a system in place for actually tracking the energy savings that, that are occurring as a result of this program? <coughs> 
Yeah, I, I'll uh, yield to Mr. Neighbors on the details of the program. We, we at GAO have just in this last two-month assessment started looking at how states were using weatherization. So far, uh, only about 10 percent of the money had been allocated to the states to begin planning activities there. More money is going to be coming down the road. We have not yet looked at the allocation formula. We'd be happy to, to do so. Uh, and also look at the measures of performance. Now, the agencies, OMB has allowed the individual agencies to identify performance measures beyond jobs created or saved, and so we'll be looking at that going forward. But since that program is just getting started, uh, so is our work. Okay. And in a similar vein, there was, in The Economist uh, about a month ago, there was, I, I believe they were reporting work from the Peterson Institute that indicated that the technologies that we were subsidizing as part of the AARA um, had costs of between, I believe, 60 and $140 per ton of carbon averted, which makes them not very promising in terms of, and I was wondering, are we putting in place um, a mechanism to track how effective um, we will be at actually avoiding greenhouse gases in programs where that is a goal. I have to, I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Neighbors on that. That is one of the things that we are looking at as far as developing performance metrics for, for all of our programs. Okay, so there will, they will extend to the environmental goals as well as just the job creation goals? Correct. Okay, and then a little bit more on this economic modeling. I guess I would um, like to say that I'm at least um, one member of Congress who understands that the predictive power of these models in a differential sense is much better, that, that you, they're, they're more accurate at predicting um, the difference between turning a policy option on and off um, rather than just the absolute predictive power, which obviously you know, has, was missed in terms of the, the big downturn we had. And um, the CEA model that you reported, is it similar to the Zandi model? It is. Okay, because I had looked in some detail at the actual formulas behind the Zandi model, and it was um, not entirely satisfactory, frankly. Um, things like the, the interest rate models going out and stuff like this. Is the CEA report, or the, the details of that model, are they publicly accessible? They are. They are well? available on so our website, all, all and I, I will provide it to the committee for the record. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, let's see. Are we I'm tracking? Another thing that we ought to, I believe, be tracking is the fraction of jobs that are created offshore. Um, in this. So, for example, when we put a lot of money into health IT, um, obviously we're going to buy a bunch of Chinese made computers. If we put a lot of money into smart metering on grids, most of those are produced offshore. And so I was wondering, are we actually separately tracking the jobs created onshore versus offshore for the different programs? We are not currently. Currently, we are only attempting to, uh, to estimate the number of jobs created within the United States. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I guess that's my questions. Thank you much. Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Davers, uh, I served uh, with Ronald Reagan during his administration, and when he came into office, uh, we had 12% uh, unemployment and 14 percent inflation. And uh, he decided uh, against some of his economists' recommendations uh, to cut taxes instead of just throwing money at everything. And as a result, we created uh, millions of jobs and one of the longest economic expansions in U.S. history. And the economy at that time was as bad or worse than it is right now. Now you said, and uh, Mr. Issa quoted you, you said, since almost all states have to balance their fiscal budgets, even in the face of recession, 40 have cut benefits and services and 28 have raised taxes and more are considering both measures. These actions deepen the impact of the downturn. It sounds a little bit like you may have agreed with uh, what President Reagan did because instead of raising taxes, which would have precipitated a bigger downturn when we had 12 percent unemployment and 14 percent inflation, he chose to cut taxes. And, and he believed that if you did that, you would give more disposable income to, to individual citizens, their, ha their families, and to businesses so that they could make more investment in, 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 their, bus in their businesses and plant and equipment and it would create more jobs. People would have more money to buy more products, therefore you'd create more jobs because they had to be produced. 
So what I can't understand is, is, is why we're, we're, we're doing what we're doing. The president has proposed uh, raising taxes on health care. It's going to hit everybody. I mean, I think everybody in the place knows that. He's talking about a carbon tax for cap and trade that's going to ha cost the average family about 31, 3,200, maybe 4,000 bucks a year. Uh, we've already uh, appropriate, uh, uh, authorized and appropriated 787 billion for the stimulus package, 350 billion for the omnibus, uh, 52 billion dollars uh, so far for 54 billion so far for the auto bailout, and of course the stimulus is 787 billion. And now you're talking about another stimulus. How can you square blowing all this money when it's not creating jobs? Biden, President, Vice President Biden said the stimulus created or saved 150,000 jobs, and President Obama asserted on June 8th that the stimulus would create 600,000 jobs over 100 days, and they said it wouldn't go above 8 percent when we started throwing all this money at it, and now it's 9.5 percent. It seems like the approach that Reagan took was a more realistic approach because it let people make the decisions and companies make the decisions on how to get themselves out of that mess instead of having the government trying to, uh, to do everything. And I just want to quote a couple things real quick and then I'll let you answer. Here's, here's where some of this money is going. Uh, did you know the Florida Department of Transportation is planning to spend $3.4 million recovery funding on the road crossing for turtles and other animals on U.S. 127? that in Minneapolis they're going to spend $2 million on a theater for dance and music events, that uh, in uh, Kansas the Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve's new visitor center and, and ped pedestrian and bike project over a highway is going to be, they're going to spend, uh, how much on that, uh, a couple million, a million dollars in Michigan for decorative sidewalks and crosswalk planners, landscaping, uh, and so on and so on. It just seems to me that a more realistic approach to solving the problems, and I hope you'll carry this back to the administration, would be instead of just throwing money at it and talk about another stimulus package, we should be cutting taxes, stimulating uh, uh, economic growth by letting people have more of their own money to spend and letting businesses have their money to invest in things they think need to be invested in instead of this sort of stuff so that they can expand their business and sell their products. You can respond. Uh, I will take your, your comments back to the administration. I, I do feel the need to clarify a few points. Uh, point one, no one in the administration is talking about a second stimulus at this point. What we are focused on right now is implementing the Recovery Act that co Congress has already passed and doing the best that we can with the dollars that you've entrusted us with. So that's what, that's what our focus is right now. Uh, second, with regard to uh, um, with regard to the way the package is actually structured. I think it's important to note that over one-third of the package is actually uh, focused on dedicated, targeted tax relief, which we believe is, is a part of a very balanced package to... Pardon me for interrupting, but the White House, uh, what's her name? Laura Tyson. Laura Tyson yesterday did mention a second stimulus. I just thought I'd clarify well, that for well, you. Laura, Laura Tyson is not an administration official. She's an, econ yeah, an economic advisor. She's, she's an outside economic advisor. Uh, she does not work for the administration. Um, but I, I, but to, to clarify, uh, the, the package that was signed into law actually does include what we believe is effective tax relief for, for the middle class, and we think it will have benefits. But in addition, because of the, the output deficiencies that the economy is currently facing, spending has to be part of the equation. And what the president has said is that over the long term, this spending, we need to bring the entire federal budget back under control. So I recognize the point that you are saying that there has been a lot of spending that has been done, and it's something that the president is very sensitive to and very focused on. It's one of the reasons why he's pushing so hard to make sure that comprehensive health care reform is completed. Over the long term, the key to long-term deficit reduction is going to be uh, bringing our health care costs under control. Right. Uh, in addition, we made it very clear that the Recovery Act spending is something that we are looking at as a short-term stimulative uh, impact into the economy. It's not something that we believe is sustainable over the long term or even, even advisable over the long term. The gentleman's time from Indiana has expired. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Hodes from New Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, the uh, Recovery Act was put in at a time of global financial collapse and severe economic distress in this country, and we are still facing a 
stubborn recession. Uh, I'm a sailor, and I know that sometimes when you set course from point A to point B, sometimes the wind changes, and uh, you need to adjust, and, and that happens, and sometimes the predicted course isn't the course that you end up sailing. Um, the good news for me from New Hampshire is that I was able to uh, go out on a highway with uh, Secretary LaHood and know that New Hampshire was the first state to put uh, highway funds uh, to use. So the transportation dollars seem to be flowing okay. What I'm hearing uh, from home uh, is that uh, other agencies are having a hard time implementing um, and reporting the funds that are coming in. The, the, the states are implementing billions of dollars of funds, but the concern is that the federal government, we aren't providing the clear, coherent guidance uh, that we really need to put Americans back to work faster and to provide taxpayers with comprehensive, transparent accounting of those funds that everybody understands. And the, the chart that, Mr. Dodara, you've put up shows that it looks like the projections for when the full impact of the stimulus dollars is going to hit is a little bit later than what uh, we had originally projected. Is that so? Uh, actually, that chart, the white bars, are the uh, estimates that CBO made during the time the bill was in, was in conference. So that, that was always the estimated uh, outlays contemplated under, under the Act, and I think Mr. Neighbors can corroborate that. Uh, the uh, gray bar, in terms of what's been actually outlaid already, you know, we think is you know, potentially slightly ahead of the pace that was estimated, and I think it's because unemployment rate's been higher. That means more Medicaid uh, federal matching assistance is there. And given the fact that the states are under fiscal stress, I think they're moving as expeditiously as they can. The, the other factor I would say is most of the states, uh, as you know, have end of fiscal years the end of June 30th. So they were waiting for a lot of approval from the state legislatures. Now that's occurred, uh, I think uh, the uh, funds will flow according to pace. So it's fair to say that while there are some, including uh, some in this room who are uh, complaining about job creation, that uh, as we see more of the stimulus dollars flowing to the states and the quicker and better we can get them flowing, uh, the more job creation and preservation we're going to see. Is that true, Mr. Neighbors? That's absolutely correct. Um, now, in New Hampshire and around the country, the growth of small business is very critical to creating jobs. Uh, OMB has stated that in its implementing guidelines that one of the goals of the Recovery Act is to provide opportunities for small business, and the SBA uh, has estimated that uh, 60 to 80 percent of new jobs uh, annually over the last decade are small business jobs. Have you at OMB set targets for the amount of Recovery Act funds directed uh, to small business? Uh, businesses? We, we have not set targets, but there are targets in the statute that we are trying very hard to, to meet. And we believe that uh, we've been able to increase the initial amount of, of small business funding uh, dramatically. Uh, originally, we were looking at spending at about 4 percent. We went back and talked to the agencies and made, made it clear that it was a priority of the administration that small business be a, an engine for the Recovery Act. And that amount of spending through small businesses has gone up dramatically. Um, are you providing any education or outreach to small businesses to ensure that they know how they can uh, access the opportunities for them in the Recovery Act? Absolutely. Uh, both through OMB, but more specifically through the individual agencies that have existing relationships with small businesses and small business uh, consortiums, we are trying to get the word out where, what type of Recovery Act money is available and how small businesses can compete for it. Mr. Dodaro, do you think that the reporting requirements to which recipients of Recovery Act dollars must adhere uh, are discouraging small businesses from pursuing or accessing Recovery Act funds? I, I, I think that the uh, reporting requirements, uh, first of all, I don't have an empirical basis to, to answer that question. We've not consulted with any small businesses or, or talked with them. I, I do think, you know, we made a recommendation apart from the one here. Uh, about making sure that small businesses and others knew of the availability of the funding opportunities and made recommendations to OMB because the uh, website grants.gov was unable to handle the volume and that there be other uh, avenues explored to make sure people were aware of how to apply for the funding. So that, that's the extent of our recommendations there so far. 
Thank you. And, Mr. Neighbors, I encourage you to continue your efforts to make sure that small businesses have access to easily getting these funds to help create jobs uh, in America. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. And the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Schock of Illinois, I yield to him for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you both for your testimony. I have two uh, quick questions. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, uh, I come from the state of Illinois, a state that has uh, roughly a $9 billion deficit. Our governor has proposed a 60 percent increase in the income tax. Uh, and uh, we're struggling with the programs and services that our state currently has. A part of the uh, stimulus plan and part of your testimony speaks to uh, the maintenance effort and the commitment by states uh, that they have to make in order to get uh, the requisite uh, stimulus dollars. Uh, my question is specifically what are we doing as a federal government uh, and what to, to ensure that when a state says yes, uh, we will continue to maintain these programs uh, to get X funding now, uh, what are we doing to ensure that actually happens, number one? And then number two, what happens in two years from now uh, in a state like mine in Illinois where we don't have the money for the services we have today and now we have additional services we don't have today that we will have to support on into the future? And what, what true um, uh, uh, force can we take or um, what measures are you suggesting that we have that can force them to basically come up with the money at the state level? I think, uh, first of all, there are uh, a number of maintenance of effort requirements in the Medicaid program, for example, that eligibility uh, standards remain the same as they were for June 2008. And I Mr. Dodaro, could you put your microphone on, please? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. uh, in the Medicaid program, there are maintenance of effort requirements in the Medicaid program, in the highway program, in the education programs. Uh, those are the big three so far. Uh, we are carefully looking at how the federal agencies are monitoring those maintenance of effort requirements. In Medicaid, it hinges on eligibility requirements. Highways, they have to provide, states have to, governors have to provide certifications. Transportation is reviewing those certifications right now. Uh, and uh, uh, there are waiver provisions, however, in there that the agency heads have in order to uh, entertain waivers from the states. Now, uh, and that's for today. That's for what today. happens in two years when uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, agreement right. that was signed by Governor A, who's no longer in office, right. and Governor B is now having to deal with the reality uh, of whatever commitment was made by that state to maintain those Medicaid le reimbursement levels or income levels to qualify right. for Medicaid. What happens in three years from now yeah. when the legislature, who's duly elected and has a fiduciary responsibility to balance their budget, decides, you know what, we can't afford these new rates that were specified in the Recovery Act three years ago that a former governor and maybe a former legislature had agreed to? Yeah. Well, well first of all, in the Medicaid area, that money ends December 2010, so it's only for a 27-month period in any event. Uh, I do think there, there's a responsibility of the government, on the part of federal agencies to make sure that they monitor as it's going along. They shouldn't wait uh, until but, two but years. But what happens, what specific action can we take to force them to honor their word? Because I guess what I'm confused uh -huh. about is we have some governors that are saying, great, thanks for the money, we'll take it. And we have other governors who are saying, whoa, in three years we can't afford the commitment that you're all asking us to take in exchange for taking the money today, and yet I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing where our power in the Congress or the President or your office has in three years to ensure that, that a new governor and a new legislature has to honor that commitment. Yeah, well, you're, you're raising a good point. I think it's something that needs to be monitored all along. Uh, okay, not, but uh, I, I, wait, I, I, it, the only reason and, I'm cutting you off is yeah. I've only got a minute left. Yeah. I've got a question for right. Mr. Neighbors. I guess okay. my question is, why shouldn't every governor take the money, tell you whatever you want to hear, because up until now, I, I haven't heard a good explanation from you as to how we're going to force them to honor the commitment that we're expecting them to take in well, exchange for the money. Well, for example, in the Medicaid area, if they don't honor the commitments, they, they don't get the matching share of the funds. For the first two years. Right. But well, what that's, all, that's in the only three? amount of funding that's available. I'll go back. I'll, I'll provide you a specific answer for the record for each of these programs of what mechanisms are in place 
uh, to make sure that those uh, uh, commitments are honored. Okay. And I'm specifically interested in not how we're going to monitor and tell them they didn't do it, but what specifically in year three and four, which from talking to the governors who haven't taken the funding, right. is their concern in keeping those higher income levels in place right. and so on, what our force will be uh, to, to go after them if they don't. Because I guess my suggestion to those governors who haven't taken the money is it sounds like you can take the money, tell them whatever you want to hear, because there's not a whole lot we can do uh, in year three and four and, and into the future. Uh, Mr. Neighbors, real quick, uh, reviewing what, I, what I've heard in the testimony, um, I couldn't agree with your, your final uh, several paragraphs in, your, in, your, quote, in your, your testimony, which basically said it's not government uh, that creates jobs, it's not government spending that will stimulate the economy, it's private investment, private entrepreneurs and risk taking, uh, and I truly believe that to be the case. Um, the gentleman's but, time has expired, so could you cut it short? Can I have a few, 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, what we know, uh, and it's been said by my, my, uh, my, my companions up here, you know, President said there's nine, per, you know, unemployment would peak at 8%. It's at 9.5%. He's conceded that it's going to reach double digits uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, your testimony here today, $75 billion has been spent uh, to create 150,000 jobs. That comes out to half a million dollars a job. Uh, your, your, your comment earlier was roughly $92,000 in government spending should create a job. So my question specifically is in the jobs number, uh, if we're not going to say we've failed in terms of being off, uh, off course on what the unemployment rate would actually be, uh, we're not even near what the expectation is in terms of job cost of government spending to create a job. If we're we're usually operating under a $92,000 per job creation number, and we've spent $75 billion to create 150,000 jobs. The time has long expired. That, that's $500,000. And, uh, and thank I think, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And now you yield five minutes to Congresswoman Spear of uh, California. Mr. Chairman, thank you. As um, we look at the chart that the GAO has provided us, we're going to be outlaying twice as much money next year as we have this year, which would suggest that if there's going to be waste and abuse, it's going to be twice as bad next year as it is this year, unless we take steps to make sure that it doesn't happen. So I'd like to understand what happens when an outlay has been made to a particular entity, let's say it's $10 million. And when the first reporting period occurs, they've spent half that money, and we now are aware of the fact that they didn't really generate new jobs or the program that was anticipated to be constructed is not, um, is not followed up with. How do we, one, rescind the rest of that money? And two, do you have enough resources to go out there and determine whether the money is being spent appropriately or not? Well, the answer to your first question, there, uh, there are sanctions for withholding some of the future funding uh, for certain programs, but it differs by program. So there are some options if there's disclosures that requirements aren't being met for uh, action to be taken by the federal agencies, but they have to be aware of it and they have to make sure that they promptly address it. On the, the second uh, question is, no, we do not have at the GAO enough resources to go out and monitor all the activity across the country, and that's why we're suggesting that the single audit process where the state auditors are already in place and they audit this money annually, that they be required to do earlier internal control reporting now before a lot of the money spent in 2010 and that they're provided some funding uh, to make sure that they can carry out their normal activities. If, if changes aren't made, the single audits for the year, fiscal year 2009, won't be issued until six to nine months after the end of the, uh, end of the fiscal year. So you'll already, already be into the next fiscal year. There is a network in place through the single audit that can be exercised with modifications to provide greater assurance uh, that the money is being spent properly. But OMB and the Congress need to act on our recommendations in order to effectuate those changes. All right, Mr. Neighbors, what's your position on that? 
We, we concur that the single audit is an important uh, component of ensuring that there's appropriate oversight. Uh, we want to make sure that there's appropriate money to the state and local governments to make sure that, that they don't have to reduce the administrative staff and the oversight staff that they have, and we're dedicated to making sure of that. We're working with the, the chairman and the ranking member to, uh, to, in support of their bill to make sure that even more funding could be potentially available to uh, state and local government to conduct those, those audits. A, a second piece that we are doing, which I, I don't want to get lost, is that uh, working with uh, Earl Devaney, who is the head of the Recovery uh, Oversight Board, he's made it very clear that he sort of he sees one of his primary responsibility uh, as getting in on the front end of projects to make sure that as much as possible we can make smart decisions and we can help the agencies make smart decisions so that we have the mechanisms in place so that money isn't wasted. Once the money is wasted, it's a shame for all of us. If we can get in and shape the programs ahead of time so that we can minimize the amount of waste that comes out on the other side, uh, that would be best for, for the American taxpayers and for the Congress. So we're working very hard with Earl and with the, uh, the various IGs to try to set up those mechanisms ahead of time as well. So I think that between the state auditors, the local auditors, and, uh, and the IGs and the, uh, the Recovery Oversight Board, we're trying as much as possible to create a network of, of oversight that will try to minimize the amount of, of waste that, that could occur from Recovery Act spending. All right, um, final question. If there is fraud, there should be a means by which that money can be returned to the federal government. Have you put that in place? Have you thought about it? What are you going to do about fraud? Well, I, I think I mean, that's the basic responsibility of the federal agency. If we find fraud or potential fraud, we, we will refer the matter to the uh, Justice Department uh, for further investigation. We're n we don't have law enforcement authorities, but we do make referrals to the inspector generals, to the IGs. We are, have made available to the public a hotline where people can submit allegations of fraud. Uh, the Recovery Act also requires the inspector generals to do the same. How so do you advertise that hotline? We, it's on our website. We put out press notices uh, regarding it. So How far, many we, calls have you received? We've received about 61 allegations so far. Uh, we have referred some to the inspector generals. Uh, there's about uh, 25 or so that we're looking into more deeply to, to assess the merits of it. And we'll be following that up. Could so we're taking that. Pardon me? Could you report back to the committee on what you find from those hotline inquiries? We'll be happy Thank to. You. Thank you very much. Uh, and now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Arizona, Congressman Flake. I thank the chairman. Thank the witnesses. Um, I'll ask a series of questions, and if I could get a pretty quick answer, I'd get to more here. Uh, the, the vice president has said that he is kind of the sh sheriff on this, he, that he, his role is to provide oversight. What specific role does he play? How, does he go to meetings? Do, do, what, what does he do? Uh, the vice president holds regular meetings with the cabinet agencies and with the implementation officials from the agencies. And he's also very involved in terms of uh, reviewing uh, agency plans with regard to broad, uh, broad goals of uh, federal spending. Thank you. Um, when, when we see programs that we are told are getting funding, it, it kind of makes us wonder when you say no. Um, if you say no. Uh, for example, um, we're told that 800,000 of this recovery funding will be used for a runway at an airport in uh, Pennsylvania that has around 20 passengers a day that fly to Washington. Uh, why, why wasn't that money turned down? And if it's not, can you give me any specific examples where you've said no? There are a number of examples where we've gone back to the agencies and, and asked a series of very hard questions and projects, got, uh, projects were removed. With this specific project, I would have to go back to the Department of Transportation and find out more about the criteria that were used to make this award. But you don't know of any examples where you've said no, uh, uh, just hard questions? Most, most of this work is done at the agencies. I would want to go back to the specific agencies and, and get the examples from them. The Vice President has said that some people have been scammed already, that's his quote. Uh, can you give any examples of that? Uh, I, I'm not sure of what the Vice President was referring to there. 
should we ever take anything serious said by the vice president? Uh, if, if, or is somebody assigned to go and retract what is said? Uh, I, I take what the vice president says very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it would be good to know what he's referring to if, if, if he's... I'm, I'm just not familiar with that quote. Okay. Um, with regard, to, again, to these, uh, CNN Money just put something out saying that $75 billion had been allocated already, paid out. Uh, you say 57. Um, which is correct? Uh, the most recent information that I have is 57. Okay. 57, and you say 150,000 jobs have been created. Uh, that's some 380,000 per job, where the goal was uh, 92,000 per job. Oh, uh, I, I think that there is a discrepancy. I'm giving you the most recent information that we have with regard to obligations. It's 57, 000, 57 billion to date. I would have to go back and look at when the, the, the job creation number was actually calculated. Uh, it's not the exact same time period. All right, but it's safe to say that we're considerably north of the uh, 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 figure of 92,000 that's the goal. Uh, I, I would have to go back and take a look at that, but I, would, I will provide that information for the record. All right. So with projects then, uh, we were told initially that uh, they needed to be shovel ready. Um, I have to tell you, I grew up on a farm and my dad always had projects that were shovel ready. They usually involved rubber boots and a corral. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I'm just wondering if there's any other criteria. Again, going back to this thing, I, I still have not heard of any examples coming from any agencies. Um, and again, going back to this one, and Mr. Burton uh, named some others, uh, these projects where you'd have to say, you know, unless you just concede that throwing money out is going to create jobs somehow or it improves the economy, that uh, you know, perhaps it would be better to give it in the form of tax relief and allow individuals to spend it. But I, I still would love for you to come back to the committee or something and give us information on at least one instance, some time where an agency has said, no, uh, just because it's shovel ready doesn't mean it's worthy. I'm, ha I'm happy to provide that information uh, for the record. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I yield to. Uh, I, I the thank the gentleman for Northern. yielding. If they could put the uh, federal deficit uh, will reach levels never seen before up on the board. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dodaro, yes. earlier you showed us your declining one. I just want to make sure uh, this one uh, appears to be your chart, but referred to in positive deficit. And I want to make sure because, again, I told you I had to take stats and I hated it. Uh, your, your downward one appears to be the equivalent of that one. Same thing, but everything in reverse uh, obviously starts a little different. And if I read it correctly, we have increasing deficits as far as the eye can see projected when you, it, it, when you express it positive because we're in deficit and your chart was in negative deficit because you have these minus numbers. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, those well, two it, charts? It, it, it's basically uh, the, the, just the reverse explanation. I mean, the, there, there's different ways to explain this uh, and, and to uh, display it. One, the chart I'm showing is the annual deficit, what it's expected to be as a percent of gross domestic product. There are also measures that you could show where there's a percent of debt held by the public as a percent of gross no, domestic and I product. That. And time, any way you do it, we've got a problem. Isn't it more standard yeah. when you talk about deficit to have it as a, as a positive deficit? In other words, a growth in deficit normally is an upward number. In your case, the downward might have people think that things are getting better when, in fact, down in your case or up in the other case, both are growing deficits. Right. Down in our case means you're going you bad. Know, you're going bad. You're, you're heading in the wrong, very wrong okay, direction. Okay. I just want to make sure everyone understood that that downward chart is really bad, and that's where we're going right now. Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Right. Let me um, announce to the members that we have three votes. We have a 15-minute vote and two five-minute votes. Uh, the committee will adjourn, and we will, after five minutes after the last vote, that we will reconvene. Okay. We need to sort of get clarification on, you know, and one in particular that uh, if jobs are retained, how is that in terms of uh, job creation? 
you know, and that a lot of areas, you know, they would have had to lay a lot of people off, but as a result of the money, they were able to retain them. And I think in, 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 in many instances, it just made so much sense to do that. Because when you look at education where you were able to uh, uh, have teachers, you know, that would have been laid off and would have had these huge class sizes that are now able to have their jobs, I think that it makes sense. And of course, uh, I want to thank you and want you to look into these issues because uh, we don't always have these until we come up with some clarification. So OMB, you really have to have some guidelines to make certain that people understand, you know, uh, what job creation means. Is it a part-time job, half-time job, whatever? I mean, these things need to be sort of made clear so we know where we're going, so we can answer questions when they come up. And I now yield to the ranking member, and then after the ranking member, we will dismiss this um, uh, panel. I, I would like to echo the chairman's uh, accolades of your being here today and, and your willingness to respond both here today and some of the follow-up that you've promised. Uh, this committee is dedicated to uh, have you back uh, essentially every time there's a new report, which is every two months. And I hope you'll indulge us in, uh, in something close to that schedule. Based on what the chairman may want, we may do it informally or formally, but it's very clear that we feel it's one of the core responsibilities of this committee and, and one that we want to work on on a bipartisan basis. And, uh, I agree we should go to the next panel, and I thank you for your service. Thank you very much.